<laughs> Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Paul Zalzo. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. And I'm Dr. Heather Badalato. Dr. Badalago is a new doctor. No, Badalato with a T. Badalato. What did Badalato. I say? Badalago. I thought you were saying, I think own. you're getting lazy. Badalago. She's a new doctor on Talking with Docs. There you go. Right. Welcome. Thank you. And she's going to be talking about naloxone or Narcan and opiate overdose today. Whoa. So it's a very serious subject, uh, a PSA kind of sorts, where we're going to show people exactly how to deal with someone who has overdosed. Or, so. Yeah, or you suspect that's overdosed. A lot of times you don't know um, what's happened if you come across somebody, but this is just how to use a Narcan kit, where to get them, and what to do if you see somebody that's unresponsive and you suspect there's been an opiate overdose. Okay, this is a useful uh, topic for uh, anyone who is out and about in the evening or in the daytime and you come across someone that you're worried may have overdosed, they're unresponsive, this is how to use the Narcan kit mm -hmm. to re reverse that. So the first part is, how, what, where, where does your index of suspicion lie? So what are the signs where you think, okay, this person may be suffering from a narcotic overdose? Well, and I just wanted to say too that um, Opiate overdoses can happen anywhere. They can be with patients who are on chronic opiates for, you know, pain and maybe they mixed it with a sedative or alcohol or something like that. Um, it can happen at a party where, you know, someone thinks they've taken, uh, you know, cocaine or some other drug and it's mixed with um, an opiate that happens, unfortunately, quite a bit where you don't know what you're getting. So there's lots of scenarios where that can happen. Um, so if you come across somebody at a party or on the street, um, the signs you want to look for is are they are they responsive? Are they you know responding if you're calling their name or telling them to wake up? Um, are they kind of blue if you look at their lips and their fingertips? Um, are they do they have cold kind of clammy skin? Are they making kind of or deep snoring noises, choking noises? Um, all those sorts of things can give you an idea. If their pupils are really small, that also might. Um, clue in that it could have been an opiate overdose okay. in situations. Okay, so we have, let's say now we have a high index of suspicion that this person has had an opiate overdose and we want to reverse that opiate with Narcan. How do you do it? So basically the first thing you want to do is just go up to the patient or the person and uh, see if they respond. So you call her and you're trying to wake them up kind of by shaking them. They don't move then you um, can give them a sternal rub so you take your knuckle and really rub it against their sternum um, and if they don't respond to that um, and you also can check for breathing um, if they're not breathing or breathing very slowly that's also um, an indication that they probably overdosed so then and just okay. the reason why the sternal rub works is because there's not a lot of tissue there and it really hurts so really hurts. if you did this on someone who is awake if you take your knuckles and rub it on their breastbone essentially it really hurts. So if you're not heavily sedated or unconscious, you're yeah. gonna grab that person's hand or you're gonna say something or whatever. That's why we routinely use this to test this. Yeah, so it's a good, pretty good indicator that if they don't respond to that, they're not conscious. So then um, if you, ha you wanna call for 911 because you don't know what's happened. You can assume it's an overdose, but you don't know. Right. Um, it could be other reasons why they're unconscious. Um, and then what you wanna do is if you have a naloxone kit, um, take it out. So okay. I actually have one. So you can get a naloxone kit at pharmacy. Um, they're free. You can also get the, a lot of safe injection zones or harm reduction sites have them. But you can usually go to any pharmacy and get them as long as they have them in stock. So and that's that's Canadian rules. We're not exactly yeah. sure what's allowed in the United States. But yeah, certainly in Canada, know. we routinely have these at pharmacies as well as other yeah. sites. So I got this one the other day at Shoppers Drug Mart. Amazing. Just walked in and got it. Okay, cool. So again, First thing you do is phone 911. Yes. Always do that. Always do that. First day of medical school, we ran through this scenario, and I was chosen to do to you know come to the scene, mm -hmm. and they said, "What's the first thing you do?" And I said, "First, you use phone 411, which in Canada is directory assistance." And they said 411, and I was like, "Yeah," uh, and asked them what the emergency number is. Didn't quite <laughs> do uh, pass that first assessment, but med school got a lot better. They're like yeah, Zao Zao, back of the bus. That's right. <laughs> okay, so show us that naloxone kit. So basically what you do is, it's just, uh, if you open it up, it's very simple. It's just got a couple things in here. It's got gloves, so you wanna put on the gloves because you wanna make sure the scene's safe. There's not like, um, there could have been a needle somewhere, so just you wanna move that. You don't wanna use your bare hands for obvious reasons. It's also got um, a mask, or sorry, one-way airway valve if you want to do, or if you're trained in CPR, if you're gonna give rescue breaths, this is kinda what it looks like. 
So you just put that over the patient and you breathe into it. So you put it over their mouth and it has a one-way valve so you can't get any of their breath back into your mouth. So it That's protects right. you, but allows you to get air into yeah. their lungs. So we don't recommend doing that if you don't have one of these. You because you don't know what's going on in the scene. And, and if you're not trained in CPR, don't yes, engage yeah. in that. Okay. So, I mean, if you're trained in CPR, you can go ahead and do that after you give them naloxone, but we're just gonna focus on what we say you don't have that training. So you just grab one of these guys. So this is a, a four milligram um, nasal dispenser. So it's got four milligrams of naloxone. You can take it out. Hold it up for everyone to see. Yeah. You said you can take it right out of the package. Yeah, I can take it out of the package. Really? Sure. We wouldn't use this one, but Would this be a standard dose? Yeah, so four milligrams is the standard for the nasal kit. There's also, you, um, there's uh, intramuscular injections too, depending on the kit, and there are 0.4 milligrams. Um, I couldn't get a hold of, they seem to be all nasal, but nasal's a lot easier for everybody anyway. So you just kind of hold it like this. I, if the patient's down, you want to tilt their head back and just insert it into one of their nostrils and then you dispense by pushing the, you plunge it all the way in and then this one's done. So you would use that, you would um, get rid of that one. Okay, and so then, how fast would the patient typically respond? If they did in fact have a narcotic overdose, how fast would they respond? So you would want to, you would likely see a response within a couple minutes. Okay. Um, so if there's no response in two to three minutes, um, you give another, um, there's two in here actually, so you give the second one. Okay. Um, and then in the meantime, if you are during those two to three minutes, if you are trained in CPR, feel comfortable, you can give one rescue breath every um, five seconds if they're not breathing. If you know CPR, you can administer that. But if you don't, you know you're doing the best you can. This is a it's obviously a scary situation when you come. And so this should that. rouse them up after uh, if it is an opioid overdose after administration of the first or possibly the second they should start yes, to wake they up you should start to see some um they should they could actually be in withdrawal so if their body is used to being uh, um or needs opiates they're dependent on opiates they're going to actually go into withdrawal so they might feel they might vomit they might be nauseous they might you mean be because sweaty. of the narcan yes right. because what narcan does is it kicks off the other opiate that they're using off the receptors because it has it's more attracted to the receptors than any other opiate. So then it makes them sick um, right. if they're dependent on opiates. If they're not, like if I just gave it to um, you know anybody Brad who's right not, now. I could demonstrate on Brad. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't do anything. It doesn't right. do anything uh, to other anything other than opiates. If it's an alcohol overdose or something like uh, benzodiazepines, it's not going to do anything. So is that mechanism a competitive inhibition of the receptors, right? You have an opioid receptor on the cell, that's mm -hmm. uh, where the opioids uh, attach onto to d deliver their effect. So Narcan or Naloxone is, inhibits the opioid to attach that receptor by sneaking in there and attaching yes. to the receptor before the opioid can. It well, has a higher affinity for that receptor. Uh, so the receptor preferentially binds to the nut. No, it'll actually displace it, right? So yeah, not just block displace. it, it'll displace it. Yeah, well then it okay. will block for that time period. But right. the thing about uh, naloxone, it's a very short acting. So it wears off very quickly. So a lot of times patients will wake up, they'll be sick, they'll want to use again if they're dependent on opiates. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that shouldn't happen. It's because Narcan wears off. So they can actually re-overdose um, An hour later. Short, yeah. So that's why they always, you want to encourage them to go to the hospital, be monitored for at least several hours because they could slip back into an overdose situation yeah. and at least have to educate them and let them know that because a lot of times people don't know. They think, hey, I'm great. I'm going to go back to the party and it's not something you want to do. Would it even be possible that their circulating opiates could still be around longer than the Narcan so that even from their, say, their dose that they took before the Narcan, could that put them back well, into? Well, that, that's what's happened, yeah. yeah. So they don't they have only, to use again necessarily, it still could be the old stuff. Oh yeah, the old yeah. stuff, so that's what wow. can happen. If it's a long-acting opiate that's kind of still around, um, it will, that can cause the overdose situation. It doesn't have to be they use again. Right, yeah. okay. So risks of administration of naloxone. Are there a lot of risks with administering? So no. you had mentioned if someone isn't, doesn't have opioids on board and you, you're, you made a bad call and you said, oh, I gave naloxone, they're unresponsive for another reason. Yeah. So, there's okay. very little downside to giving naloxone. Um, there's really no risk if the patient doesn't have opiates on board, it's not an opiate overdose, nothing's going to happen. Doesn't so, interact with their other medications. Nope. Yeah. No, or foods, herbs. The only time you would ever not give it 
which is I've actually never come across this. If you're aware that the person is allergic to some component of naloxone, which I don't know anyone that knows somebody's allergies on the street, mm -hmm. if you don't know, you still give it because mm -hmm. the risks are way too high of them not waking and up. And the important thing is that if they don't have opioids on board and you administer naloxone, it's not gonna have a negative Does effect. Does nothing. Which yeah. I was wondering about, and it won't, it won't, it won't, it won't reverse anything else. If it's no. not an opioid they've taken, it won't be effective then no. either, right? Other uh, drugs that they might have on board will not be effective. So that's a, a minus side to it. You know, if they've yes. overdosed on something else, this isn't going to help. But it's still worth trying. Yeah. Oh yeah. Why are you definitely. waiting for nine one one to get there? No, I always call nine one one. So you pro. So the, uh, just to summarize, we said we saw someone that we were worried they were unresponsive. We tried to rouse them, couldn't. We called nine one one. And then the third thing you do is administer the naloxone if you suspect an opioid overdose. Right. And then if they, um, if you're comfortable or you, you can give one rescue breath every five seconds if they're not breathing, if you know CPR, you can do that while you're waiting in between naloxone doses. Okay. Usually wait a couple minutes and then um, if you have an injectable kit, you just break the ampule, um, there's a needle in it, you can take out all the fluid and then you can inject it in their outer thigh is usually the easiest place, but most of the kits now are... Amazing. So it's important to have these kits around, we yeah. want to re yeah. you know, remove the stigma associated that you might have or some you know, biases you might have, it's important to have these, you know, I mean it seems mm -hmm. odd to tell your kid to, hey, don't forget yeah. the naloxone kit when you go out, I mean it's not at that point yet, but... Mm -hmm. Don't yep. feel weird about having an naloxone kit around the house. It should be like, you know how you have defibrillator? Your first aid kit almost. Yeah. Then, yeah. yeah. You have like a defibrillator at an ice rink. Yeah. You should have mm -hmm. a naloxone kit at a rave. Yeah. Well, there are there. actually, um, I was reading recently, I think Ontario is going to be teaching uh, teenagers and kids in school how mm -hmm. to use a naloxone kit. That's because it is such a big problem. And a lot of times kids are going to experiment. They're going to use um, drugs and what they think they're getting may not be what they're actually getting and I've seen it many times with you know patients in my practice in the past where you know they found themselves in an overdose situation been saved by naloxone so I have one in my car I have one in my ups you know it's but you do have to watch um, in the summer because you want to keep them at a certain temperature like the room temperature so you don't want them in a hot car but um, you know more in general um, just in your home or you know, if you're okay. in a medical situation in your office. So we're going to be teaching this to young people. So we might get a nude demographic, nude, nude demographic. New demographic. No, new demographic, not a nude yeah. demographic. Put your clothes on. <laughs> well, and, and we're in a time in, in history where it, addiction and unfortunately use and overdosing, even overdose deaths have gone mm -hmm. you know, sky high in the last couple of years. So it's a really, really important topic. I just wanted to say one thing too, it's not always um, people who overdose necessarily, um, people who are experimenting or dependent on um, or abusing um, opiates. It can be even patients who are on chronic opiate therapy and you know are on a sedative or on other sedating drugs and I've actually seen that in um, my practice and um, you know when I was working in hospitals where we would see patients who were prescribed and taking them as prescribed but ended up in a situation where you know because when you're taking a sedative and an opiate or alcohol one plus one can equal five not two and yeah. So that can, you can find yourself in a scary situation then too. I've actually prescribed it. I mean, the only time I've ever seen used is in a hospital setting, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, where, where the opioid overdose is iatrogenic. So it yeah. was a, just too high a dose was ordered. Yep. Mm -hmm. Someone had a very uh, strong response to the opioid yeah. and then we're like, oh, oh, better order some Narcan. They, they're, they're not rousable in the hospital. So that, that word is iatrogenic, which is a fancy way of saying uh, the doctor or the medical treatment caused it. What's the mm -hmm. cause? That is, a, that is an awesome summary. Um, thanks to Dr. Badalotto for sharing her experience and her knowledge on this really critical topic. And if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. And share this with someone if you think they think it will be useful. Oh yeah, please share this video. This might help someone out there along the way. We'll see you next time.